Hi, I'm Amy from Fox Run, and welcome to my channel. We talk about organic gardening, wildlife conservation, and environmental education. And today I have a special guest from toadsandfrogs.com, and we're going to talk about toads and frogs. <laughs> yeah, I can't wait. It's going to be so much fun. <laughs> hey, everyone. My name is Daniela. Um, thanks for having me today, Amy. Um, I'm a master herpetologist certified by the Amphibian Foundation. And um, I'm super passionate about frogs and digital marketing. And uh, yeah, I don't know everything. I mean, there's 7,500 frog species, but I'm going to do my best to answer the questions that we have today. <laughs> wow. I had no idea there were so many frog species. Um, that's incredible. All right. So tell me, where did your love of frogs come from? Yeah, so when I was like six, there were toads in our backyard and um, I'd never seen them before until like that time. And I thought they were the coolest thing. Like they were tiny, they were hopping around. And I mean, I really enjoyed observing them through the seasons. Like uh, in the spring, you know, they'd come out of hibernation. They'd eat like little piggies during the summer. And then they'd be huge in the fall and then hibernate in winter. So I just, I just thought that whole cycle was really cool and I loved observing them. But then later on, uh, I moved to Europe in a place where there were no frogs and of course no American toads. And I mean, it's only when I came back to North America later on that I heard a few uh, calling and I thought, I, I actually thought that they were ducks <laughs> at night. I was like, what's that sound? So I had to go check it out and uh, they were wood frogs and I'd never seen any other species actually, which is crazy. I'd never ever seen any, any other species other than toads at the time. So I was like, whoa, like, okay, what is this? Like, I started looking online and I found the worst Google search results. It was crazy. Like frogs eat chopped up birds. And like with my level of knowledge, I was like, I know that's not true. <laughs> like they don't <laughs> eat, uh, like really bad, like incentivizing people to kill frogs with bleach, like lots of things that made me really sad as someone who loves frogs. And so at the time, it's interesting, I was looking to start a new project where I felt like I had some kind of um, giving back, like a real implication where I could have a real impact, something that was I could do that would be impactful. And when I saw that, I was like, okay, this is the project I wanna work on right now. I wanna outrank all of this content and really provide the best possible content about frogs uh, with integrity, respect, kindness uh, from an educational standpoint, because I have a background in, in teaching as well. So. Yeah, that's how, that's how I came to start the site in frogs. Yeah. Well, that is very, very cool. And, um, you know, there's a lot of similarities uh, between us um, because yeah. we both put, you know, education uh, first. And so um, it's, it's great that you took this, um, you know, love of frogs that you had as a child and you've given it a real purpose and a real intention. So that's um, awesome. All right. So I know I've wondered this and a lot of other people wonder. So what is the difference between a toad and a frog? This is such a good question. And I've seen it so much online, people debating each other. They're like, no, that's not. <laughs> da, da, da. I'm like, OK. That's scientists. We like to debate. <laughs> <laughs> it's all good. The thing is, all toads are frogs but not all frogs are toads. So you can call a toad a frog, but not all frogs can be called toads. So I'll explain. Um, within the family of amphibians, most people know that you have salamanders and frogs, but there's a third group called Sicilians, which a lot of people don't know about, so it's just an interesting anecdote. And then within the group of frogs, frogs are called anura, technically, which means amphibian without a tail at the adult stage. That's how they differentiate from like salamanders, for example. And so within that classification of a neura, which includes all frogs and toads, you have toad families. So there's groups that differentiate from other groups of frogs. Um, and Bufanidae, which is the true toads, is probably the most known group, which includes American toads, for example. So I guess you could say all toads are frogs, not all frogs are toads, and toads are part of different families within the group of frogs. That, yeah. um, yeah, that is fascinating. And I, yeah, I've thought 
and I mean, I have a degree in environmental science, but we really don't get into species specifics. But I kind of thought, yeah, they were, um, you know, different. And toads were maybe more land oriented and frogs were Absolutely. more water oriented. So there's, there's characteristics that kind of separate the toads. What makes toads different from other frog groups, I guess you could say, or like um, families of frogs. Uh, they have a parotid gland behind their eye. So it's a very large gland. All toads have this. Um, and they secrete toxins from that gland. The interesting thing that people need to know is that toad species um, secrete different toxins. Some do secrete the same kind, but a lot of them secrete different toxins. And so the whole, like, I got these comments on my channel. Anyway, don't be licking toads, first of all, <laughs> no matter what species it is. Okay, you're gonna get salmonella first before anything else. Like, I mean, bad idea. But long story short, they don't all secrete the same toxins. So if you're looking to do something, it's not a good idea no matter what. But anyway, that's that. But uh, yeah, it's super interesting uh, that toads can can do that, and some can even shoot it out. Anyway, it's fascinating. <laughs> so the toad can project the toxin. Cane toads, yeah, like. Oh my they can gosh. Get really big, yeah. It's intense like when like especially when uh, an animal will clamp on it it's just like um, right yeah, and, yeah. Huh, so, well that would make me food. stop wanting to eat it or lick it yeah <laughs> oh my gosh okay this is fun i'm learning all kinds of stuff cool <laughs> all right so it's springtime when we are recording this it's may and um I know I am hearing a lot of frogs and I don't always have the best luck finding them. So what are some good ways to observe frogs, you know, without um, terrorizing them or, you know, scaring them? How can we kind of sneak up stealthily and, and uh, yes. get to watch them? Absolutely. So I guess my tips are kind of North America focused in a way, just because like I am from the East Coast, so I know like mostly the species here, but a lot of what I'm going to say still applies no matter what, where you're located and what kind of frogs you're looking for. I guess my general tips would be, first of all, to be patient. <laughs> oh, well, I know that part. <laughs> I did too at the beginning. I was like, oh, this is taking forever. But yeah, okay. We try to go in the evening at night. That's generally where most frog species are out. Some are, most of them are nocturnal. Um, around mating season is the best time. So we're talking in the spring, this is when you can hear them. So it's easier to pinpoint their location. And so what you would generally do is you would approach the area where they'd be located. They're generally gonna stop or they might not call as much. It, it depends on the, the species. I know in spring people will stop calling right away when I approach. And then you just kind of wait and wait to hear one. And then you kind of zero in on that one that you hear calling. If you can hear one like really loud, and then you try to get closer to it. So you get closer, it might stop. You get closer, it's gonna stop. It's like, it takes a while, that's why you gotta be patient. But once you get there close enough and you hear it, if you have a flashlight, cause generally it's like early evening, you might flash your light and you'll see something shiny around, like look around the base of the tree or like on branches and things like that. And if you see something shiny on the ground, that typically is the frog. Like I, for most of the time where I've done this, it's because it, it's more of a dry evening. So like you'd see the shiny thing, which is the wet frog. Okay, so that does help uh, if you're looking for them yeah, at night. That makes sense. And then I guess more specific ways to find them. Um, that's just general tips, but more specific, let's say it depends on the type of frog that you're looking for. I kind of group them into three things, but uh, there's lots of different kinds. This is kind of like a generalization, but let's say aquatic frogs, tree frogs and toads. Maybe you'll have different luck using these different tips. So aquatic frogs, a lot of them are out during the day from what I've noticed, like the ones in my area, um, along the shallow areas of pools of fresh water. So <laughs> I don't know, I had someone comment one time, they're like, I went to the beach, I didn't see any frogs. I'm like, okay, well, I mean, that's like intense, like waves and salt water, there's not gonna be any frogs in the sun. So you really wanna go to locations where it's like calm, fresh water with lots of um, vegetation. And um, you wanna look among the vegetation. And so sometimes it's species specific. Uh, spring people are mostly out in the evenings. Uh, I mean, if you're looking around water and they're gonna be around areas with no fish. So depends on some, some frogs prefer certain types of water bodies. So you, you'd wanna check out what's in your area too before you, you go out looking. 
uh, for tree frogs, you can look around the base of the trees typically, and then down branches. So you've got your tree, and if you, if you look down a branch and you see like a lump, something shiny, that could be a frog. Yeah. And then toads on the ground. Uh, I love toads. They're just like, they're just there. I was on a walk the other night actually, and I saw one out and it was so, it was trying to get over the curb, poor thing. And I knew right away it was a toad. So I, I helped it up over the curb and then they went right to the pond where it was going. It was so cute. But yeah, I mean, they're out at night. They're just doing their thing. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> I, um, I think they were spring peepers, but I'm not totally sure. But um, when I had the farm, I would have stock tanks and the stock tanks were full of water. And I had a pond but it was a little bit farther away when the, where the barn was and the spring peepers would come lay their eggs in the stock tank. Oh no. <laughs> and so then I'd end up covering the stock tank, getting yeah. another, um, you know, water source uh, for the animals um, so that the, you know, eggs could then hatch. And, yeah. uh, and then the, um, the funny thing is we tried taking those them to the pond um but i don't think that worked out so well um mm -hmm. and then at one point i just um covered it and waited for them to become you know frogs and eventually hop out uh, my son put pieces of stick sticks floating um branches and things in the water so that they could then get out when they were ready but um mm -hmm. But it was pretty funny and people laughed at me because I had totally rearranged my watering system for the goats because we had, you know, frogs in the stock tank and that was important. So yes. um, thank you from the frogs. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they were so cute and so much fun to watch. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. But you were talking about just now helping a toad um, get up on a curb. And so I love the video on your channel. I think I wrote it, I wrote it down. It was in, it's the one that's intense toad in road rescue. And so I, I just love that. But um, so, you know, I, I don't see a hot road as a place, uh, you know, a toad would want to be. So why do we see toads out and about on the roads so much? Absolutely. It's a it's a common problem. And um, I mean, no matter where there are frogs breeding, generally, you're going to have frogs crossing roads because they migrate. And um, the adults generally come down, go to the pond, lay their eggs and then leave and go back to where they came from. So uh, they could cross, you know, multiple roads. When that happens, um, oftentimes the toads were used to or the frogs in general were used to going from that one place to the other place and there was nothing in between that would be in the way. But then you have, you know, urbanization, deforestation that happens maybe uh, between the seasons. And so that obliges road crossings for these animals that could be crossing, yeah. you know, country roads or even highways. And I mean, they have very little chances of survival. I actually saw a study done in Toronto recently where like it was, it was a huge problem. They were losing so many amphibians. And um, one way to mitigate that is by putting, um, of course, the city has to do this, but uh, it's like a, a crossing for animals underneath the bridge and frogs, yeah. salamanders, they can all go underneath uh, the road and, and go to the other side. And they had done that not too far from where I live. And it had saved 99%. Like they had actually done this study and it, it was it was amazing. Oh, like wow. All they need to do is just install this thing to help them cross the road. Or sometimes I know this is very popular in the UK, they have patrollers. So, I mean, if you want to help out and you can join like some kind of patroller group, I don't know if there are any, any in the States, but UK, I know that there are some, you could actually go and they block the roads and they try to do education and educate people when they're driving through. And then they'll like help the frogs cross the road, like physically with gloves on and everything. So that's really cool. That is really cool. I have an article on uh, the Fox Run website about wildlife crossings. And I think myself included, that um, we often think of those for larger animals, um, yeah. animals that are kind of getting genetically stuck, um, bears and, and cougars and, you know, other larger animals. But I don't think we, you know, pay enough attention um, to the need for, you know, 
frogs and other, you know, amphibians um, to be able to get where, um, you know, they need to go. And it's funny because when you were talking, I was thinking about turtles and I love yeah. turtles so much and, and have done turtle rescue. Um, but it's, it's very much the same thing. I kind of sometimes attribute it to, you know, a turtle that lives a long, long time. And yeah. so they, they do have a memory of where food is and where mating with, um, you know, where, uh, you know, they might find mates and things. Um, but maybe with the frogs, it's just more instinctual. They know they need to get to the water and, you know, they know where that water is. Um, so that makes a lot of sense. Um, I kind of, you know, I've, I've done the same thing. I've stopped and, and said, Oh, why are you in the road? We need to get you out of the road. Um, but that Absolutely. makes sense because, you know, the frogs as adults are often living on the land um and with several species and they need to get to the water because that's part of their reproductive cycle so um yeah, i thought it was fascinating amy because actually you're the one who told me about the turtles i didn't i didn't know about uh like they, it's true it makes sense like they live a very long time so they have that memory and yeah. i mean over 60 years how much has the landscape changed around where all of us live a I'm lot certain, yes right so frogs don't generally don't live as long but uh, actually they don't live that long i think one of the longest was a frog in captivity for 40 years was a cane toad. So, but it was in captivity and like, I mean, yeah, so. Right, but that's still a really long time. I, I yeah, think yeah. Uh, that's a, still a really long time for an amphibian. In the wild, like uh, the longest is like maybe 10, 20 years if they're like doing great and they're in a very like <laughs> uh, environment where they can really thrive. But there's some species only live two years, like as adults and everything, like they reproduce and then, so yeah, but uh, definitely turtles, it's fascinating how, they have that memory and like, yeah. you know, they want to get to where they have to go. Yeah. And they're pretty determined about it. <laughs> That's why we always say when you pick up a turtle, you take it in the direction it's going, because if you try to take it to the other side of the road, it will just turn around. It's That's what I was thinking. Okay, when we, when we save those toads, first of all, I was like, I don't have any gloves, but there was a car coming. So like, what do I do? I lift it. No. Okay. No gloves. Fine. I'll pick them up. I put them. And then I was thinking, I'm supposed to move them in the direction. Cause you told me this. you're supposed to move them in the direction that they're going, but they were going in the opposite direction of the pond. And I was like, they're going in town. There's nothing over there. Like they would have died for sure. So I brought them back to the pond. And I was like, I think in this case, it was definitely okay <laughs> to make an exception, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, um, and, you know, and, and sometimes with development, we've drained marshlands, we've drained water areas. And so, you know, they might have that memory or that instinct that, you know, there should be a water source there, right. but, you know, in the process of urbanization, we've drained it and, you know, built, you know, whatever we've built. And so um, I'm, I'm sure that's very confusing you know, for the animals as well. Mm. So, um, yeah, we like to build things too much. <sighs> but then we just talked about having that, like crossing under a road. If you're going to put a road through a marsh, then put a crossing, you know what I mean? It's just like, yes, it, it should be logical, but. Eh. Yeah. And, um, you know, you can advocate um, to your community, to your representatives, um, you know, when when we're building roads in areas or if, you know, is and for my um, in my community, they're having big arguments about expanding the airport. Now, it's just a small, more private plane airport. But if they expand, it will go into some more natural areas. And so, you know, I voiced my opinion. Um, I can't force them to do anything. And I do just have by one vote. But I can be vocal that I do have that one vote and, you know, this is my concern. And so, you know, we can all kind of find out what's going on in our area as far as development and, um, you know, advocate for wildlife crossings. So mm -hmm. that is a very good point. Um, but, um, but yeah, I love that video. I thought it was great. <laughs> Thank you. It was totally improvised. It just happened. And I was like, okay, yeah, we were filming anyway. We we're like, okay, like, oh, it was, it was 
I'm glad that happened. Like, I'm glad we saved them. Yeah. All right. So I, um, before recording this video, I had put on um, my YouTube community and my Facebook and my Twitter and asked, you know, do you have questions about frogs and toads? And so um, I got some really good uh, questions. And so um, these are questions from people in our audience. All right, so this is from Metro Hen and they ask, anything we can plant to encourage frogs to take up residence? Yes, this is great. I'm glad that people want to to do these things to help frogs in their in their backyard. It's a perfect place to start. We were just talking about you know doing city level things, but starting right in your own backyard yeah. is amazing. So I guess for general advice, because like we're all in different places, um, I would I would say plant local plant plant species. So if you go to like um, a garden center or a botanical shop to to get your plants, make sure that they're local species. Um, um, also things that can attract bugs is a great idea because your frogs are going to need food. So if you can have something like flowers or things like that, um, composting is also a great idea. If you have a garden in your backyard, that's going to attract bugs. It'll attract frogs. So it can be helpful. Yeah. Um, also depends on the species in your area. So I, I do some research to see what could you potentially attract in your area, um, depending on where you live. Maybe you could have um, aquatic frogs and then you'd want to put in a pond in that case, like a, a small frog pond. Um, if you could attract toads because there's toads in your area, then you'd want to probably compost and have little garden lights to be able to have the, because they like bugs at night. That's what the attracts toads, garden lights. So yeah, something like that. So um, I guess tree frogs, you probably want to plant local tree species, you know, that the, they would enjoy um, leaving patches of grass open. I'm going to talk more about tips for this in, in another question, but I think those are pretty good tips just to start to try to attract them to your, your yard for sure with plants. Yeah, and um, that makes a lot of sense. And, you know, because if you want frogs, you need to have, uh, I actually have a video in progress about wildlife gardens, but you need to provide food and water and shelter, you know, for any animal you wish to attract. So that makes a lot of sense planting flowers. So you're drawing in, in bugs. And if you're a gardener, the um yeah frogs and toads are very beneficial because they eat some of those bugs that you you know don't want so mosquitoes um, who wants me like, yeah great for mosquitoes yeah, yeah there you go <laughs> um so we we asks i'd like to know why i seldom ever see frogs anymore i live on the river but also really close to a distillery I mentioned the distillery thinking it could be pollution. So from this question, I'm just gonna assume that maybe we, we had frogs there before and now they're like, okay, where'd they go? Like there's less of them or there's not as many. Um, so for sure, frogs are definitely a sign of a healthy ecosystem. I can't say for sure that it, it would be the distillery or not, but like, let's consider a couple localized factors just to like think about it. So maybe, have there been major changes in the area? Like, has there been urbanization, deforestation in that area? Um, has the water quality changed over time? Has the temperature fluctuated a lot? Uh, is the flow a lot stronger? Because frogs won't stick around water that's like, the flow is too strong. Because of course they don't want to lay their eggs in a place where there's too much flow because it'll just take the, the eggs down the river. Or, so yeah, they're, they're gonna, choose very calm areas. So I don't know, maybe the flow has changed. Maybe there's less vegetation. It could be pollution as well. And then I'd look at like maybe global factors. I mean, this is kind of affecting everyone probably watching this, but I mean, we've got urbanization, deforestation, pollution, um, climate change in general. The pet trade is also contributing, unfortunately, to uh, the decline in frogs globally. And uh, there's this um, fungus there's a few, but the most um, known one is a uh, chytrid fungus. It's very uh, common in Australia. Unfortunately, they've lost a lot of frogs due to this. And there's a lot of groups of scientists and local citizens doing the best that they can to help the frogs, especially during, like actually frogs breed a lot over there because I mean, the temperature's great. So they've got like a great environment to be active all yeah. year. 
But uh, yeah, so there's a lot of people helping out with that in Australia specifically. Um, but yeah, those are probably a couple reasons why the frogs are in decline. Wow, that's a lot of. Uh, uh, Amy, I was in uh, I was in <laughs> Lisbon recently, and I went to a, like a museum because they had like a frog exhibit. It was really cool, but there was this whole wall, like a big, big wall, like it was really big. I don't I don't know how to anyway, and it was just in tiny, tiny font of all the frog species that are have gone extinct, and like uh -huh. been, like, and I'm, I was like, wow, like it. Yeah, it was it was really heartbreaking to see that because. I mean, yeah, well, anyway. Yeah. yeah, um, yeah, I would find that heartbreaking as well. And, um, you know, frogs have a thinner skin. And yeah, so I can see where they are very sensitive, you know, to all of the things that you talked about, you know, sensitive to the pollution because their body is, you know, in the water and kind of, you know, fluid exchanges and um you know just the changing uh, temperatures i can see where they are just um you know sensitive to that and would have a hard time you know you can't adapt quickly enough um to a lot of things you know humans have not adapted quickly enough um so <laughs> yeah, yeah so the poor frogs <laughs> i mean there's a lot of cool adaptations. I think we'll talk about it later on, but it's definitely, yeah, it's unfortunate. Um, so I've heard others mention, you know, we're talking about the frogs uh, declining populations. Um, and I don't know why I didn't, um, I think somebody asked this question other than me, but I don't have their name down. So whoever asked this question, it's a good question. Uh, and I it's Wee Wee. It's, I think it's the second part of Wee Wee's oh, question. Oh, it's the second actually. part of all right, awesome. Thank you, Wee Wee. Um, <laughs> so is there anything we can do to reverse, you know, this kind of, you know, sliding downhill that we're on? Yes. Um Okay, we're going to go back to the backyard thing. I think there's like three levels where you were three main levels where you could do things starting right in your own backyard. Um, you can do things at your city country level and you can do things globally too if you want to get implicated more on a global level. So starting in your backyard, um, make a, a, a backyard that's friendly to frogs, um, especially if you have a lot in your area. If you can make like a little haven for them, that's amazing. Like it'd be so cool. Plus you get to observe them. Like that's what I loved about having that yard as a kid now in an apartment, so I, I don't get to enjoy that as much, but yeah. So plant local plant species, add a water feature, um, like a little fountain or something, um, add solar lights to your garden, like we were talking about earlier. A lot of people complain about toads. Well, that's how, that's how it's attracting them, those lights and those bugs. So that's a good way to attract them. Um, let the grass grow in in some areas. Composting, we talked about. A toad abode. <laughs> yeah. Um, so Amy, I didn't, I didn't realize it was called an abode, but yes, it's a little toad house. <laughs> Maybe that's a gardener thing. Uh, you sent me, because Amy sent me that, that word earlier and I was like, oh, that's a toad house. That's so cool. Cause I was just calling it toad house. But anyway, yeah. Um, I think it's really important that people know not to have a base on it. So I, all it is, is like a, it can be like a clay pot. I think I have one back here. Like, yeah. Like, oh maybe, yeah. Anyway, that. But like the terracotta. Exactly. Yeah. You can make like a door on it. I have a video on the channel on how to do it. But as long as the base is not um, covered, because uh, some of the videos I saw online, it's just the toad can't burrow, toads burrow. And that's, that's what they want to be able to go down into the soil. So they're not going to use a toad house if it has a hard base and they can't, that they can't penetrate. So um, hibernaculum is cool too, also for toads, um, if you could have those in your backyard. Um, it's like a space where you dig a big hole. I ha there's an article on, on our blog on how to do it, but uh, maybe a meter deep. And then you put in like soft sand. And the goal is to make a place where they can hibernate in the winter time. And it's just easy for them to oh. dig into that, that sand. Right. Of, yeah. So. Awesome. Awesome. A, well, I'll make sure to link that 
um, I, and I know you sent me some other links, but um, we will have all those links in the description so you can go look that up and, uh, you know, do that in your backyard. Yeah, thank you. Um, another tip is to avoid the use of pesticides. That's not going to keep the frogs around. Um, and then if you have a frog pond in your backyard, make sure it's sloped. Um, no rigid edges because the toads, the frogs need to be able to get out uh, if they can't get out they're not gonna stick around. So just make sure that the edges are kind of sloped in some areas at least so that they can easily get out. So that's your backyard, uh, just a couple tips. And then for the city, if you want to implicate yourself on a city level, um, you can do what Amy was talking about earlier, help protect your local wetlands, uh, get involved in environmental protection in your city, become a patroller like we were talking about earlier, like in the UK, I know that there's a couple groups that do that. And then, I mean, if you're in your area, you know that there should be a frog crossing somewhere, you could try to get one done or support or form local movements in your area. So if you want to have a patroller group in your area for those two weeks where the frogs migrate or whatever, you could, you could advocate to start that. And then on a global level, there's a couple um, conservation groups on a global level. I don't, I don't really know, I can't recommend anything. Um, but I know that there's some groups that you could donate to or be part of or things like that. But um, I just have to say this, okay? Because we can't talk about climate change unless we talk about inflation in our monetary financial system. Um, because inflation equals climate change. I know that's really hard to wrap our heads around. <laughs> <laughs> I understand, okay? <laughs> but I highly recommend um, a book called uh, The Price of Tomorrow by Jeff Booth. And if anyone wants to learn more about going to the root cause of climate change, like at the bottom of it, it really is our, our global financial economic system. Like we have a system where we have to expand constant, constantly, where we have to consume more and more on a finite planet that, that only has a certain amount of resources. And so we're really, it, it's not like I can make efforts, you can make efforts. We can have groups of people making efforts, but at a systemic level, it's very hard to beat that. And so there's alternatives. I just recommend that book. I think it'll be really helpful to the audience. I um, I mean, I know we talked about this before, and a lot of that is over my head. I do get the <laughs> finite resources um, because, you know, that's the issue we have in the uh, fossil fuel industry is is that, um, you know, the joke is that there are no more dinosaurs dying and becoming oil. So um, yeah, exactly. You know, eventually uh, that will run out. And so um, any any podcast by Jeff Booth, I would recommend to anyone who wants to go down that that path and to understand from a look for a, a podcast from a climate perspective, because uh, he talks about a lot of different things. But yeah, climate change and inflation is correlated and it's the base reason. So. Yeah. All right. And another yeah. part of um, we we use question. I'm sorry, I've chopped up your question kind of, I guess. Um, so um, she had mentioned frog legs. And so, you know, I'm from the South. I'm, I'm from Kentucky. And in Kentucky, we call it frog gigging. And uh, yeah. that's, yeah. that's yeah. the term, um, you know, people go out and catch, uh, you know, larger. Usually in Kentucky, I've always heard that it's bullfrogs. Um, and, you know, they have a really loud voice, so you can kind of target them. But um, um, I don't necessarily eat frog egg legs, but uh, they are considered a southern uh, dish. So, um, so yeah. could, can you address that? Can you, you know, talk about that a little bit? I did want to talk a little bit about this. I lived in France for 10 years and the French are known to eat frog legs. So I have tried them. Um, I mean, I'm not against anything. It's all good. I think I have a couple tips for this. I'd encourage people to um, like purchase ethically sourced frog legs. So if you know a local hunter who is doing it ethically and locally, great. Uh, I mean, I know that gigging, they use spears. It can be very violent. Uh, some people shoot them. Like I, I have an article for hunters on the blog and I was, I was hesitant to write it. And then I was like, this is an opportunity to educate. And so that article, what they were looking for is what the laws are in their area, when can they gig, how much, et cetera. So we gave them the answers. And then at the end, it was like, okay, 
what are ways that are a bit more humane to do this hunting? Like, okay, shooting them is just impractical. It's not nice. It's like, we just explained it very, like, in a good way, just to like, try to meet people where they are because they're gonna go hunting anyway. So I think as consumers, we have a choice of choosing where we get it from and who we buy from. So ethically yeah. locally sourced is what I would encourage the most. And then of course, like you were talking about earlier, that the species is important. Um, American bullfrogs, they're invasive in multiple places in North America and they get very big. They can be the size of a yeah. small cat. <laughs> yeah, they, they do get big. <laughs> they are mouths on legs. Like, it's so <laughs> crazy. <laughs> like, yeah, they, they can eat bats, uh, mice, like they will just sit and eat all day. So, I mean, okay. I mean, it's a good sized frog to uh, consume their legs and they are a problem uh, in, I mean, I know the Pacific coast uh, of the states in Canada. So uh, the common water frog in Europe is um, one that's very uh, common to uh, that, that people eat. So that's more for Europe, but there's species to avoid. Um, if you're going to consume them, I would recommend avoiding personally. Uh, leopard frogs, apparently, and they're not even that big in my opinion, they're much smaller than, than American bullfrogs, but they are also sourced for consumption, but they're they're endangered because of that consumption. And also because, especially because of high schools using them for dissections. And so oh, yeah, if you're gonna consume frogs and these ones are from North America. So if you're gonna consume um, frog legs in North America, avoid leopard frogs because they're endangered because of how much they're being used in high schools and for consumption. That makes a lot of sense. And I did not realize that um, bullfrogs were not necessarily native across, you know, North America, um, because no. I don't know, I feel like I've seen them in every state I've been in, but I guess that's kind of the definition of an invasive species. <laughs> yeah, it's actually because of um, grow like growing them, I don't know how to say, like uh, sourcing them. Um, they were brought over from our side of the coast to the other side. And uh, I guess from what I read, there was a few that escaped the facility yeah. where they were being. And then they just kind of proliferated because their mouths on legs and they eat good. Right. So, I mean, <laughs> yeah. Well, and that's why, you know, um, we have raccoons around the world is because, uh, you know, the pet trade. Oh, yeah. And um, yeah, and now there's a sizable raccoon population in Europe because, you know, escape pets and it always happens. And and so, you know, and then the raccoons are eating, you know, that's an issue that they are eating some of these native amphibian species yes. um, in, in Europe. Um, so, uh, yeah. We, um, you know, we always want to be careful with with pets when we get exotic pets, um, you know, and not ever letting them um, go on purpose, because sometimes that does happen. Um, I have a, a good friend that's um, Arrowhead Reptile Rescue, which is outside of Cincinnati, Ohio, and um, he's one of the few people I know that takes um, pythons and um you know other large snakes because people get them when they're small and they don't stay small you know they um get very large as some um tortoise species get very large so we always want to be you know kind of thinking about um you know how big the animal gets and what they need as an adult um because what happens is that um you know the animals often then you know turn loose which is, you know, the issue, and I'm rambling, but no, <laughs> this is the issue we have in the Everglades, but even um, in Kentucky doing um, a rescue, um, you know, people would let large, um, the African spurred tortoise, which is sold in pet stores. Um, I took in several of those every year, and, um, you know, then they uh, would need to be rehomed. They were pets, but they can't, they're, from the African desert, they can't survive a Kentucky winter. And so, um, you know, we just need to think about that. Same, same with frogs, you know, thinking about what their needs are going to be and not just letting them go and finding, you know, if you need to rehome it, uh, finding someone who can do that. So I'll stop mm -hmm. rambling. 
<laughs> no, no, I, I agree with you. And it's a super interesting, personally, I think it's super interesting. Um, I think I think one of the things with frogs is that, like I said at the beginning, there's over 7,500 species. I mean, they all have specific needs. Like mm -hmm. it's yeah. before getting a pet frog. I don't, I, I have a video where I say, I don't have a pet frog and here's why. And the first reason is because I don't like bugs. So like, I mean, if I don't like bugs, <laughs> I can't have a frog. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. a good video. I like that one. Thank you. But yeah, you, you definitely have to really know how to cater to that that specific species of frog and like never never abandon your pets. I think that's like that's logical, but yeah. Yeah. All right. The next question is from Katie and Laura, and they do for the Love of Nature podcast, um, which is a younger podcast. It's great. I I recommend it. They did uh, it's been a month or two ago. Um, they uh, actually interviewed um, Carrie Krieger, Dr. Krieger, who um, is saved the frogs, and I think, I think he's in Texas. Um, but they um, they did a frog podcast. So um, their question is: In your opinion, what is the coolest frog adaptation? I love this question and I couldn't help myself. I had to write out a couple of them, so. <laughs> but I'll get my favorite at the end. Okay. So I think um, here are a few cool frog adaptations just for the audience's general knowledge, but um, there's a couple of frog species that can change color, especially during mating season. So more frogs, for example, they're from Europe. Uh, the males turn blue during mating season to distinguish from the females. So that's a really cool adaptation. It is really cool. and. I did not know that frog even existed. And they are blue, like not just a pale blue, but they're a very pretty bright blue color. So yeah. Frogs I love that pretty. you said pretty because like the pictures <laughs> I found, I have on the blog, they, they look like they're just like the most beautiful frog ever. They're just chilling yeah. in the pond. It made me laugh so much when I saw that photo. I was like, I have to do a profile on these. They're too cool. <laughs> uh, yeah, biofluorescence is also a really neat adaptation. And um, if you wanna learn more about that, Jennifer Lamb has a ton of research done on this, super cool. Um, also the saltwater adaptation is really interesting. Um, we were talking about how you wouldn't find frogs at the beach uh, earlier, but um, some frogs have adapted to be able to survive brackish conditions. So water that's half salty and half fresh in a way. Uh -huh. um, yeah, and cane toads are known to be able to <laughs> lay eggs and survive and you know reproduce and everything in, in brackish conditions so yeah I thought that was interesting and I think one of my favorite my favorite way that the adaptation of frogs is uh, their ability to change gender and so I have the, yeah it's pretty cool I have this quote from recent research from uh, Lambert and Al 2019 I thought it was interesting just to give a quick background about this uh, what they said in their research is while sex reversal and intersex are often considered aberrant responses to human activities and associated with pollution, we found no such associations here. Our data perhaps begins to suggest that relative to what's often suggested in other research, sex reversal may be a relatively natural process in amphibians because prior to that study, a lot of the studies before Hayes and Al had said that it was an aberrant response. It's not a, like, it's bad, that that does like, oh, it's because of pollution. Certainly the pollution contrib contributed, like definitely. But I love how in a pristine environment, he had done it like I, in the course I had saw that. He went out into it like a forest, pristine environment, uh, a little pond, like out in the middle of nowhere, no pollution, nothing. And the frogs were able to change gender. And so that was like a, a an example where maybe this is actually normal in frogs. Like it's normal in many other species. So, um... I I was when I've heard about that before. I've wondered: Are they changing sex to meet the needs of their population so that they can more successfully reproduce? I don't know if they know the answer as to why exactly they're doing it, yeah. but I'm pretty sure it's probably like I personally. I would imagine, like I'm guessing here, nothing scientific, right. but I would imagine that it's because. You know, there's more females and males or more males and females. And so just for reproductive purposes. Yeah, it makes sense. Um, so, well, those, I mean, frogs are very cool. Yeah. Um, 
So the next question is from Catherine, who is the Cat Needle Felts um, on Twitter. She makes really cool felting um, felt animals. And um, so she has a backyard pond and I'll put the um, picture up, uh, but she had taken a picture um, of a frog with bloat. And so her question was, what are the causes of frog bloat? And I think both of us were kind of stymied by this um, uh, question. Um, Daniela had actually um, worked with a vet assistant on, on trying to find some answers with this. And um, I can't stand to not know something. So <laughs> I went digging. Um, and uh, so African dwarf frogs, um, which are popular pet species, um, do get frog bloat. Um, and I don't think this is what Catherine's frog was this species, but just as far as context, uh, it um, what is happening, they, it's uh, colloquially referred to as uh, droopsy or um, hydropsy. Uh, so what's happening is um, the frog is holding in fluids, kind of like sometimes humans, uh, we retain fluids. And it kind of just seems to me, is, it seems a little bit odd. You know, they're in the water, they're an aquatic, the African dwarf frogs are an aquatic species, but um, from what I kind of gather, they have a tendency. And so they kind of, you know, fill up with, with fluid, which as we can imagine, um, you know, is not healthy. Um, and I'm sure that can be painful if your skin is stretching and whatnot, um, but it's a, a lymphatic um, issue and um, it, it can be treated uh, a veterinarian can, you know, drain the the fluids, um, but probably getting to that root cause of of why it's um, happening is important. Um, but that was uh, that was just really interesting. So we both learned, um, you know, some uh, some things about uh, you know frog. I wouldn't call it a disease, I guess, but a um, yeah. condition. I mean. We, we wanted to answer that question. It was, it was a question that I knew needed to be answered. Uh, and, and one of the questions people were asking is how to drain the frog. And so I, I asked the vet assistant I was working with on this, because I don't have a vet background, like I don't, I can't. Uh, and she said to me, look, I can't find this answer. Like we really need a qualified, someone who's really specialized in that and who knows how to drain a frog. So yeah, but yeah. Amy, thank you for your excellent research. You found a lot of reasons why it happens, which is important to know. Um, and it is hard because, you know, I did turtle rescue and, and I did a few snakes. Unfortunately, when snakes come into wildlife rehabilitation, they've often been run over by cars and their back has been broken. And so it can be very hard to, um, you can't like a turtle with a shell. Um, you know, we would glue their shells basically back together. but um, you know, that said, it's, um, it's very hard to find um, good research, um, you know, documented cases, and it's hard to find veterinarian information about reptiles and certainly amphibians. Yeah, and, um, you know, it, it can be hard to find a vet, uh, you know, that specializes in those animals. Um, one, one thing that's interesting though, Amy, you were talking about uh, African dwarf frogs and African clawed frogs. They're two types of fully aquatic frog species, which is pretty rare. Um, not most frog species aren't fully aquatic, like they live in water like fish in a way. Um, okay, yeah. I guess if there's scientists, because a lot of uh, scientists work with these frogs to do their studies. And so, I mean, maybe there's someone listening, I don't know. But if there's someone <laughs> who has experience with this and could help us answer that question like more in detail, it'd be really cool because because uh, they probably come across that problem if they're if they're working with the species regularly. Yeah. Well, that's a really good point because I've had a couple of um, people come on and where I've had some turtle videos and looking at some subspecies and correct me on photos with subspecies. So if they're good with, you know, frog issues too, then, you know, I, I'd love to have you chime in in the comments. For sure. Yeah. So, yeah. 
Um, all right, so my friend Tony had several questions. Um, Tony um, has worked on the board with Fox Run. We're a, a nonprofit, and um, he has a very nice um, wildlife nature kind of a backyard area. And so his question is, um, I have frogs in my goldfish pond. Anything I should do to keep them and the fish happy? Yes, great question. <laughs> um, I had some general tips and then just a little bit of a fun example of something. But um, generally, you want to make sure that the um, pond is sloped, at least in areas where the frogs are located so that they can easily get out. Um, otherwise, you don't want to have those rigid edges. Um, they have to be able to, to exit. Uh, vegetation to make shade because the frogs are going to probably hang out a lot in the vegetation during the day. Um, platforms in the water, if possible, to have areas where they can sit, like a little solar fountain. And I know this because my parents actually put in a pond where they live in Europe. And they weren't expecting, they did not do this for the frogs at all. They were just like, oh, a pond in our yard, like it's so nice. And then they did a great job because it became a mini ecosystem and the frogs appeared. Like they just came from the area and then just started reproducing there and like hanging out. So, um, yeah, I mean, if you, and they had a little solar fountain, like a little, like this big with a little fountain and it was really cute. So the frogs would sit on the solar fountain and just kind of go around the pond and they were like shaded with the water. It was, it was the cutest thing. I loved it. So <laughs> yeah, if you can have little platforms in the, in the water and like tall vegetation, floating vegetation, like uh, water lilies or things like that, whatever's local to your area. And then yes, frogs and goldfish uh, can, co like fish in general can coexist in a pond. The only problem is that they could eat each other depending on the size. So <laughs> you just kind of want to make sure that your frogs aren't bigger than your fish and your fish aren't bigger than your frogs. Like just kind of, you know, um, typically it should, should be okay. But I mean, you might lose a couple to predation between them. But anyway, um, and then be careful around mating season is my biggest tip here because uh, this is crazy and fascinating. Uh, I saw it on the, when we were writing articles for the blog, the, there are fish. Uh, there are frogs that will ride fish during mating season and people are very confused they're like why are there frogs attached to fish and like snakes in australia as well huh and, yeah and so the thing is um it's known now that uh, certain species will test anything to find a female of the same species because you know we said more frogs earlier they change color well toads for example american toads <laughs> this happened to me American toads will, will clasp onto anything during mating season, including inanimate objects like branches, uh, other females of different species, males of the same species or whatever species. They're just trying to find a female of the same species they can reproduce with. And so when I was a little kid, I was like, you know, near my toad. And then it jumped onto my finger and it was like not letting go. And I was like, what is happening? <laughs> I found out later as an adult, but like, I was just like, okay, like I managed to get it off, but it was, it was uh, checking to see if uh, my finger was a female toad and nope, it wasn't. Yeah. So, well, I, yeah. I think that's great. You were the toad's girlfriend. For like, yeah. Okay. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> that happened, but uh, yeah, eight year old me. Um, so my tip is to be careful around mating season because if your frogs are clasping the fish, they can actually kill the fish and that's kind of what what could happen so i mean they'll stay on there until until they realize um that's not a female and that can take a while sometimes so <laughs> yeah if you could maybe separate them in a way during mating season if it's possible i mean but otherwise just keep an eye out and see what's going on if there's that issue maybe a species that doesn't do that but i know american toads definitely do uh for sure so <laughs> all right and um and the other thing is um speaking of backyard ponds i can't remember if you were going to talk about this with another question you you have those and uh, gidget has to join me she's clawing my legs um you have that frog log thing on the website that's true i didn't talk um, about it you're right you're right okay well i mean thank you for bringing that up because it's important. I mean, this is going to happen to some people watching this possibly. It's a common problem. People have frogs in their uh, pool during the summer or, or spring too. 
the frogs don't know. They're just looking for a place to lay their eggs. And the issue is that's where that slope is a big problem. Uh, they can't get out of the pool. They, some do manage to get out, but still like the water's not the right temperature. There's chlorine. Like there's just so many reasons why it's awful for frogs to be in a pool. And so there's this company in the States uh, called Frog Log. And it's just a little floating platform. And it actually helps tons of wildlife, not just frogs specifically, but like uh, there were squirrels on there, uh, salamanders, any small animal that might fall into a pool and needs to get out and that can't get out because of that slope is missing in most pools. Well, there you go. You, put, you install a couple frog logs and you have a, a way for them to escape. So yeah, I, I think it's a, a wonderful product. The only thing is I talked to the owner of the company and he was telling me that there's a lot of copies on Amazon. And it's so sad because there's tons of sales on Amazon and it's not going to this guy who invented it and like, you know, yeah it's a whole wildlife background so yeah i mean our site has a link directly to his site uh an affiliate link so if you want to use that you can use that otherwise just make sure to go to frog log the actual official site and not like through amazon if you can yeah just to support him that, I think um, to support. yeah yeah that that's happened in the wildlife rehabilitation world with um the miracle nipple which was oh, actually yeah. developed. It's a little nipple. It goes, I have a short on it. It goes um, on the end of the syringe for feeding tiny, you know, like infant squirrels and, and, and things. And um, so it um, was actually developed and invented by a woman who is a wildlife rehabilitator, um, but there's been a lot of um, knockoffs um, and she sells it on Amazon. It's just that um, uh, I think she sells it maybe at a, at a price because it's made, you know, in America. And um, and sometimes you get things that are made in other countries that can be made much cheaper. And yeah. so, um, but um, well, goodness. <laughs> All right. So Gidget's not going to be on my lap anymore because she's being irritable. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> so. Um, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, I saw the frog log on your website and I really like that because I have heard in wildlife rehab circles, you know, where, um, a lot of baby animals and um, when they're first kind of, um, venturing out of their nest, you know, um, squirrels and bunnies and, and those kinds of things fall in pools. And yeah. so, you know, they think, oh, look, I can get a drink of water and, you know, it's kind of a little bit of a drop. So exactly. Um, yeah. Uh, so our next question um, is from Kai, and she was a volunteer at Fox Run, and um, she is absolutely awesome, and she is um, very knowledgeable in reptiles and um, and in amphibians. So she uh, is. Um, a, a good resource uh, was always a great resource for me. Um, so her question is, when it comes to invasive species, what's something we can do to help protect our local ecosystems? Uh, before I answer the question, I just wanted to say, I think invasive species are, are super fascinating. For some reason, I just find the topic <laughs> really <Okay>. interesting. <laughs> And I wanted to give an anecdote about Cuban tree frogs because they're invasive in a lot of places and they actually cause blackouts because they're on the, the uh, telephone lines and everything in, in like electric boxes and they'll just like cause blackouts in cities. They're costing some cities tons of money. It's crazy the extent to which like an invasive species can be a problem for local like other yeah. animals in the area and then even economically for like a, a city or yeah. whatever. Um, I also thought this was interesting. Uh, the Fort Collins Science Center had said that invasive species have become one of the greatest environmental challenges of the 21st century in economic, environmental, and human health costs. So well, I can believe that. I mean, if you look at all the money that has gone into the emerald um, borer, the, the beetle that eats, uh, oh. um, now I can't think of it's borer or beetle, but anyway, um, you know, it's destroying trees and affecting the lumber industry. And I've heard that they have had a very, you know, bad um, economic um, outcome on, you know, that whole industry. So, 
Mm -hmm. like, I know it's not the same type of beetle, but they're, they had introduced cane toads to Australia because like cane toads are a huge problem. They're from South America originally, but in the 30s, I don't know, we thought it was a good idea to kind of export them to multiple places, including a lot of islands. There's a huge list on the site. I can't even name it. Like there's, they're in Florida and they weren't native there. So cane toads were brought to numerous places and there's actually only 200 that were brought to Australia in order to eat the cane uh, beetle, the beetles and the cane. Oh. But, I mean, the problem is cane toads don't climb. There's <laughs> toads are awful at like jumping. Like they're not, like, I mean. <laughs> they they're are, not. they're kind of cute and fat and they just yeah, kind of hop along. <laughs> that's it. They're, they weren't preoccupied about what was happening in the cane. They were like, I'm going to go eat everything else everywhere else. And they went from a population of 200 to thousands, like everywhere, all in there moving down, they're migrating down Australia and like people are so over it over there. And I understand I've gotten a lot of like, the thing is, I just want the audience to know there are 7,500 frog species, lots of different species of toads. And so I get a lot of hate on the channel because of cane toads. And I understand the Australian's perspective, like they don't like them. But I'm talking about American toads, they're different. They're not invasive, they're tiny, they're doing their thing. You know what I mean? It's like totally different. So just the no amalgamations of all the toads. But uh, yes, cane toads are a big problem in multiple places around the world. And so my to answer the question, what can you do about them? Unfortunately, I can't say specifically, but I would say follow local regulations because what, what you're supposed to do with about cane toads in Australia is different to what you're supposed to do about them in Florida. And so in oh. Australia, they recommend that they freeze them. Um, but of course, I mean, I've gotten comments of like things I won't repeat here. People will do to them, which is very sad. I hope maybe the channel gave them a little bit more of compassion for these animals. But yeah, apparently in Australia, they had found that freezing them was the most humane way to deal with the problem. So that's what they do there. Um, of course, not legal advice. If you're in Australia, I double check. <laughs> like, I mean, this is what I've done for my research, but like, and plus the provinces might be different depending on where you're located specifically in Australia. But uh, yeah, so the thing is follow local regulations, do what your city says to do about them. Because if you do find invasive species, there's probably something that your city has recommended or your jurisdiction has recommended as a way to deal with them. Um, yeah, so you want to do it legally, of course. And then of course, I thought that was interesting. Uh, the pet trade. I mean, the pet trade is a huge problem as well for invasive species, just like we were talking about earlier. Um, I, I don't, I don't usually talk about salamanders, but I thought this was so interesting in the course that I took. I, I kind of want to share it here. Um, of course, don't don't release your exotic pet into the wild, first of all. But if you could help educate others, if you don't have one and you know people who do, um, there's um, so salamanders in uh, Asia. There's a thing called bee sal. It's like a it's yeah a, a fungus. Yeah, but they're used to it. Those salamanders are totally fine. It's like normal. It's part of their environment. It's all good. But these um, salamanders are imported into North America and into the pet trade. And so if ever someone's, um, you know, Asian salamander is released into the wild, there's a big yeah. chance. And this is one of the big things about the uh, amphibian uh, foundation. They have so many salamanders in their area. It could be a huge threat to the populations of yep. salamanders. So you have to be super careful not to release any exotic pets because that could really threaten the biodiversity that they have in uh, multiple places. But I mean, specifically Georgia, they have a lot of different kinds of yeah. salamanders. So. Yeah, and I did some others, research yeah. on that one uh, because I have a couple of salamander blogs and mm -hmm. I saw where um, scientists and uh, you know people in the pet trade were also recommending um, treating if you have a salamander that has you know water uh, feature or or water in their you know enclosure that you have them in and even um being careful about how you disposed of that and when you were just cleaning uh, the tank mm -hmm. or the you know enclosure that you had for the salamander or salamanders um because yeah. it can actually even just like say dumping out the water um, from their pool can affect the local environment um wow yeah, yeah. you have to be super careful right good point so um yeah, that, that's another um, biggie. These poor amphibians, they have a lot of, uh, um, you know, diseases. It's so crazy that they've been issues. around since 
Yeah. yeah. But when you think about it, I mean, they've been around since like the dinosaurs. Like these animals have adapted so much. It's really crazy. So it's super fascinating. But I mean, we don't have to make it harder for them. You know right. what I mean? Like, right. Exactly. All this other stuff going on. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I'm really grateful that your audience is so receptive and that a lot of people here want to, you know, help frogs and like start in their backyard. I think it's a great place to start with like ponds and planting local plant species, all that. Like, thank you. It's really encouraging to see because I've seen so many like bad comments. I'm like, like, not bad. It's just like, oh, you know, I'm going to kill cane toads. I'm like, oh, why? You know what I mean? Okay, I understand. But it's nice <laughs> to see some encouraging, like, all right, let's help frogs and, and do something in our backyard, you know? So thank you. Yeah, it is. Well, thank you so much for joining me. This has been great. Um, I know I've learned a lot and I like learning and, um, you know, I'm always striving, uh, you know, to do better things for the environment and to help wildlife. So um, this has just had so many, um, you know, so much good information um, that, you know, I can take with me and, and hopefully the audience you know, has gotten some great information. Um, but I want to make sure everyone knows where to find you. And we will have links and things in the description. Um, but Daniela can um, tell us um, where to read all this great information you've been talking about or watch it. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, you can find uh, more information at toadsandfrogs.com. Um, and then uh, on YouTube, toads and frogs as well. So N instead of and. And then yeah. in the sources in the description, we're gonna have uh, links to everything that we just talked about. So if you wanna learn more about uh, gender changes, conservation, um, how they migrate, how to attract toads to your garden, like everything will probably be below. And then if you go to the site, I just wanted to address, you'll probably see a banner that says that the site is for sale. And so the reason is I worked on the site for two years, I built it up. With my goals were integrity, helping mm -hmm. frogs, um, educating the general population where they are in their Google search. Just like I talked about earlier, the hunters, that's where their mindset is. So like, where are people in their search and how can I help educate them? And so uh, the site has gotten over a million views throughout the last two wow. years. Wow. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> how about that? Thank a million you. people that want to know about frogs. It's good. Yeah. I'm really happy. I think, I think I've had a great impact, but like I don't own an amphibian association or foundation my vocation like I, I'm not in that like 24 7 and so I really want to pass the baton on to someone else of course I know the audience who's watching right now is not like a, <laughs> and a, I'm not pitching to the audience it's more so if you know of someone who would be interested and who owns a business an association a foundation in the amphibian space that's really who I want to pass it on to I don't want to sell it to another internet marketer or someone else who's just going to like profit from the income I really want to give it to someone who can make an impact with that website. So that's why I'm waiting until the end of the summer to, to start that. So yeah. <laughs> thank you. Well, <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you so much for coming on. And, you know, I wish you the best of luck in, you know, all your future endeavors, because, you know, you are going to have a wonderful mark on you know, whatever you choose to do next. So <laughs> thank you, Amy. It's always a pleasure talking with you, Amy. I really appreciate it. <laughs> so thank you so much for joining us and have a wonderful sunny day.